Monroe, Monroe School District staff, uh, new hires, welcome to the Monroe School District. My name is Greg, I am our Risk and Safety Director here in Monroe, and today we're going to be outlining the district's protection specifically against a known hazard, and that is COVID-19 in the workplace. So keep in mind, uh, we are going to have a whole host of different people watching this training. We've got school teachers, custodians, and bus drivers, paras, administrators, nurses, and many, many more important people working to do good things for kids. That's you. What you all have in common is that you work for the Monroe School District. Congratulations. We employ about 700 people and serve around 7,000 kids. And you need to understand something. When we work in an organization of this size, you are going to encounter all varieties of people, all different sorts of beliefs, and all different kinds of actions in the workplace. So let me be blunt about that. What I mean is, in a public-facing organization like ours, a government organization, uh, you're gonna encounter people specifically about COVID who think they might die if they take their masks off. And you are probably gonna encounter people who think that COVID-19 is nothing more than a fabricated government hoax and everything in between. So here is the takeaway from your risk and safety director. Regardless of what you believe, while you work for the Monroe School District, you are expected to treat each other kind, to be a professional. Remember, you represent the Monroe School District, a local unit of government who serves the public. And you, an employee of this entity, you're required under state law and local policy to take certain actions regarding COVID-19 and other hazards in the workplace. That's why we're here today. We're gonna to take a 10,000 foot view and cover the district's requirements regarding COVID and specifically some protections that we have in place for both students and for you as staff and the other staff that you're gonna be working with. Remember, as you come out of this training and as you start uh, your role here in the Monroe School District serving kids, remember you're valuable. You play a critical role in what we do for kids in our community. So treat each other kindly. Be patient, even with people who feel differently than you do. And remember, as we've been re reminded so many times over the last couple of years, expectations and requirements for COVID-19, especially in the workplace, especially in schools, they can change very quickly. So I'm asking you to stay flexible, stay patient, and keep the goal of serving kids on the forefront of your minds. Okay, so let's talk about COVID-19. So, what is COVID-19 and what are we doing about it in our schools? Let's talk about COVID-19 first. Uh, the coronavirus it has caused severe acute respiratory syndrome actually long before uh, our current pandemic in 2002 and 2012. You probably know these as SARS and MERS. However, out of the realm of the coronavirus, there a novel coronavirus emerged in 2019. And obviously, as you probably know, it's spread globally and it's spread exceptionally rapidly. It is highly transmissible. It's a pathogenic coronavirus that causes acute respiratory disease. And infected persons can have a wide range of, excuse me, a wide range of symptoms from none to severe pneumonia and other illness. Uh, what the research has found thus far is that children and young adults uh, can often be asymptomatic, whereas other people, especially older individuals, are at a higher risk of severe disease. We know that the incubation period uh, for COVID-19 is usually about five days, uh, and this is data that I'm pulling from the Center for Disease Control, the CDC. About 81% uh, of uh, COVID-19 cases are classified as mild, and about 14 cases are 14% of cases are classified as severe, uh, and that leaves about 5% uh, of cases that are classified as critical cases. And, and if we take all those numbers together and we look at additional demographics, about 95% of fatalities from COVID-19 uh, occur in people older than 45. Uh, what you're looking at here is an image uh, of when we actually activated our incident command structure in the Monroe School District. This was many years ago. And uh, here's another slide uh, where we have uh, some more data. You, you can see how fast things regarding COVID-19 have changed in the world. And here's another image from just a few days ago uh, as we start up our 
2021 school year uh, here in the Monroe School District, you could just look at how fast these numbers have changed. And I want you to keep in mind here again, uh, in the words of our uh, local health authority uh, uh, officer, Dr. Chris Fitters, our knowledge and understanding of COVID-19 is just growing in leaps and bounds since it was first detected, not last January, but even the January before that. Uh, so that's just an overview of where we're at. Some of that you probably already know, and that's okay. But we're all get, we're getting everybody on the same page here. Uh, let's talk specifically about some of the hazards of COVID-19 in the workplace. Uh, really, the hazard of COVID-19 depends on a bunch of factors, uh, including uh, how much transmission of COVID-19 is happening in the workplace, what kind of existing medical conditions you or other people around you have, whether or not you're vaccinated and other things that can be used to control the spread of the virus. Uh, without any doubt though, uh, older adults and those with underlying medical conditions, especially respiratory conditions such as lung disease, are at a higher risk of severe illness. So let's continue here talking about COVID-19. Uh, we know that COVID-19 spreads, uh, COVID spreads primarily through the direct inhalation of contaminated droplets released into the environment when you're sneezing, when you're coughing, or when you have some kind of contact via oral, nasal, or eye mucus membranes. So because COVID-19 is a hazard, and we are, again, a public entity, we're working with kids and community members, and we know that we have COVID-19 transmission in our community, that means it is a risk in the workplace. And so we have to provide you information and training because we wanna keep you safe and we wanna keep our kids safe. So. Let's specifically talk about uh, what that means for employees. Uh, OSHA and the Department of Labor and Industries has essentially divided up hazard categories for employees based on a couple of different kinds of exposure risks to COVID. Uh, negligible, low, medium, high, and very high risk levels. And essentially as an employee, based on the kind of job task that you're doing at work, you will fall into one of these categories of risk for COVID-19. Uh, and I'll just give you a few examples here. Uh, negligible risk would be if you're working entirely alone. There's a very low risk, in fact, negligible risk of COVID-19 at that point. A low risk uh, would be if you're not working in a setting that's open to the public or you're not working around students. Medium risk would be any person who has interaction with students or they're working in a place that's open to the public and that escalates all the way through our high and very high risk tasks, which would be, uh, for example, medical professionals that are working around known or suspected COVID-19 cases. Now, based on the kind of tasks you do for your job, you will be assigned a different risk category for COVID-19. Your supervisor is gonna be communicating to you directly what that risk category is, so you don't have any questions about that. Uh, that should be very clear. Now, each risk category uh, mandates a certain level of protections uh, that we offer employees. And we're gonna be talking about that here in just a second. So before we start talking more about what the Monroe School District is doing, uh, just one more thing about COVID-19 that I have to make sure you know, and that's the signs and symptoms, and sometimes the lack of symptoms that come with COVID-19. Uh, again, symptoms don't always appear when an individual has COVID-19, and when they do have symptoms, typically those symptoms appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Uh, some of the symptoms can include fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, sometimes diarrhea. These are symptoms of COVID-19, and I want you to understand that if you're experiencing some of those symptoms, you should talk to your medical provider, uh, and uh, you may, if you're coming into work and you're experiencing some of these symptoms, certainly uh, what we're going to be discussing here in just a second applies. So we understand COVID-19, we understand what it's uh, done to a degree uh, to the world over the last few years, and we know that the Monroe School District, as a government entity, and you as an employee that we care about, we have to do something about it. So what are we doing? And essentially this boils down to a simple fact. You as an employee have a right under Washington state law to come to work free from recognized hazards that are likely to cause you severe bodily harm or possibly death. 
every workplace has that requirement. And LNI, the Department of Labor and Industries, and other agencies set standards to ensure that employers meet those requirements. This has resulted in our district going very carefully through the requirements that the Department of Labor and Industries and the Department of Health for Washington State set to ensure that we're doing everything we can to keep people safe. Uh, we rely uh, on their expertise as medical professionals to dictate what we can and can't or should and shouldn't be doing. And again, as they get more and more understanding and more and more research is done about COVID, these regulatory agencies go back and forth on what schools and employees and students can and can't do. For example, just a few months ago, uh, in fact, uh, over this last summer and even into last year, we had two quarantine books that came in uh, that we were giving out to kids because we thought that uh, those books may increase the likelihood uh, if they were touched by a student and then went to another student that somebody might contract COVID-19. And that guidance has changed from the regulatory authority. So that's just one example of how things have changed very quickly, uh, but I probably don't need to tell you that because you've seen and felt uh, how schools all across the nation have had to change and be flexible. And congratulations, you're a part of that flexibility now, and we're gonna continue working with that together. Ultimately, it's the decision of our locally elected officials to determine how kids go to school and what safety requirements must be in place to enable you to come into work safely. Some of those locally elected officials and local agencies uh, include our school board and the Snohomish County Health Department uh, officer, who is Dr. Chris Fitters. That can also include the Department of Labor and Industries and the Department of Health for Washington State. Fortunately, those entities, specifically the Department of Health and Labor and Industries, have set very clear standards on how we can bring employees and kids safe into the workplace. So I wanna share a little bit about how you can get to the places uh, that are setting some of these standards for us. So you can look at those directly. And also again, as things change, and we know they're changing very quickly, the best place for you to get accurate information is gonna be directly from uh, Washington State Department of Health and Snohomish County Department of Health and possibly the Center for Disease Control. So let's take a look at where you can see uh, some information about what schools are required to do uh, and where you can get some information about local case counts and rates in our specific community. So let's take a look at that. So what we have here is I've just gone into Google. Uh, I've typed in Snohomish County Health Department and you can click on the snowhd.org site and that's gonna take you to their main website here. And then there's a bunch of information specifically about the health department. And what we're concerned about with right now is the COVID-19 information section. If we click on that, yeah, we're gonna have a bunch of different options here. This is some great information all over the place, but we're specifically, again, looking at the schools and childcare information. Let's go ahead and click on that for now. When you come in here, you might have questions about, well, my goodness, uh, how are we supposed to screen people? Uh, how are we uh, verifying how many cases we have or, or tracking close contacts? What are we supposed to do if we receive a COVID report after hours? You're gonna see a lot of information on here that you may not need to know, but perhaps you want to know, uh, and this is a great place for it. Uh, if I go down here to the bottom, specifically, you're gonna see this K-12 schools 2021 to 22 guidance. And if you click on that, that's gonna open up a PDF that has the most accurate requirements for the 2021-22 school year. These are requirements from the Department of Health that we implement for our kids and for our adults. I'm not gonna go through this with you because we have essentially translated a lot of this information directly into our MSD-specific COVID-19 safety plan, but I do want you to be able to see where it lives. This is where it lives. If you have any specific questions, you could check here and you're probably gonna get some good information about what you're wanting to do. If we go back to our, our main uh, Snohomish Health District webpage here, I'm gonna just go back to our coronavirus information page. And what I wanna do is show you where you can get information about what's going on in the community, and that's our case counts and our data here. If we click on that, we've got these three wonderful buttons that show up, local case counts, snapshots, and the data dashboard. And I find both of these, or all three of these, to be very useful. I'm just gonna show you these two, local case counts and the data dashboard. If we go to the local case counts page, this is going to give us information specific to Snohomish County on how many cases there are in the county and what our hospital data is. 
And some of these graphs are really helpful for us. And I want to show you specifically this graph here. This is our case rate per 100,000 people for a two week rolling period. And you can see we're coming off of a very steep rise and we're starting to plateau a little bit. This is updated typically in the afternoons on Mondays. This case rate applies because the Center for Disease Control indicates different levels of community transmission. And essentially anything over 100 cases per thousand individuals per a one week rolling period is considered a high transmission. And you can see, again, this is a two week rolling period, so you have to do a little bit of math here, but uh, we are well above the high community transmission risk guidance. And that changes what we put into our specific safety plan. So again, speaking about being flexible, uh, as case rates change in the community, along with other information, our safety plans may also change. While we're here, I want to show you specifically how we can go to uh, the Monroe School District specific plan, which is what we're really going to be working through here. I just clicked on the Monroe School District website, that's monroe.webnot.edu, and on the far right, top bar, can't miss it, COVID-19, we've got a bunch of information here about testing sites and vaccine information, that's great. What we're concerned about today is our plans. What does our policy and procedure say we have to do as employees and kids specific to the hazard of COVID-19. We can see that by clicking on the safety plan here, right on the main page, MSD COVID-19 Staff and Student Protection Plan. If we open that up, this is the 10,000 foot view document that we're going to be going through together. So what we're gonna do here uh, very briefly is go through this plan paragraph by paragraph because if you're coming into work for the Monroe School District, you need to know and follow this plan. So let's just uh, take a peek here and we'll go through it. So let's go through our MSD COVID-19 protection plan. Again, this is the 10,000 foot view uh, for what is required of staff and students in the Monroe School District. And again, keep in mind, uh, this can be more specific than what the state or federal entities require. Uh, so for example, uh, the state or LNI might say in such and such a setting, you're required to wear a low risk mask. And the Monroe School District might say, well, we want to be more specific than that and require a median risk mask. And we have done that in a few places. So this is going to be uh, the bread and butter of what we need to make sure we know when we're coming back into school. More specific than this plan, your site that you work at, doesn't matter where, it has a site-specific incident action plan that outlines exactly what your site is doing for COVID-19. That's gonna include information about schedules and specific information about how these safety protocols apply to your uh, site and your specific job tasks. So make sure you check in with your supervisor and ask them about that plan. You can receive a copy, it will be posted in the staff lounge. That's uh, going to have more specific information. So. Let's go through our 10,000 feet view COVID-19 protection plan. Uh, we've got some assumptions up here to start with. And of course, this is formal terminology. This is a formal policy that indicates there is a real hazard in the workplace. There is real sources of exposure. And we've got a couple of key principles for protection here. The first is something of a cultural change over the last couple of years. And that is that individuals who are sick have to stay home. Uh, and I am probably just as guilty as uh, the next person uh, saying a couple of years ago, if you had something like a, a cold or a light cough or something like that, sometimes you just kind of tough it out and you come into work because you care about what you do. Uh, and now uh, that's not the case. If you are sick, we have sick time here in the district. If you've got questions about that, you can reach out to our human resources department. If you're sick, you're displaying symptoms of illness. And we talked about some of those already specific to COVID-19. You should be staying home. Uh, in fact, if you're symptomatic in the workplace, you can be uh, isolated, quarantined, and then directed to go home. So please stay home if you're sick. Physical distancing, this is a requirement. Uh, it is a, a principle, and we need to apply physical distancing wherever possible. We'll talk about that more as we get into our plan here. Hand hygiene should be emphasized when we arrive to and leave from work. Same with our students and other, at other times, for example, going to the restroom before eating, high and hygiene needs to be something that uh, we are emphasizing as a district, and you'll see that in the plan. 
Uh, face coverings, masks, and other layers of protection should be used when appropriate. Uh, that is something we'll again talk about here in just a bit. And we've already mentioned real briefly that sick individuals or those displaying symptoms uh, can and will be isolated. So let's uh, dive specifically into our controls for protections here. Uh, so first off, anybody who is displaying symptoms of COVID-19 or who has been directed to quarantine from a local health authority uh, or somebody who's not fully vaccinated, they're awaiting the results of the COVID-19 test, not a random test, uh, but a test because they think they might have been exposed as a close contact uh, in the past 14 days, these individuals cannot physically come into work. Uh, something to note here, uh, all staff are required underneath uh, governor's mandate, which is law right now, uh, Everybody who works for the school district has to be fully vaccinated by October 18th. And if you're not fully vaccinated by October 18th, uh, there is a real possibility uh, that you will no longer work here. Uh, there are a couple of exemptions. There's a religious exemption and a medical exemption. And I highly encourage you to reach out to your human resources department uh, to discuss some of those if that's something that you're interested in. Everybody else, you need to be fully vaccinated. And again, this is a state requirement. We, as a school district, we can do nothing except follow state law, and that is state law. Uh, vaccinated staff and students uh, are going to be verified on-site using the state database uh, primarily. However, we also accept a CDC vaccination card and some other things. Uh, if you'd like to talk about some of those other options for verifying your vaccination outside of the state database, again, reach out to our human resources. Uh, last year, uh, we were doing screenings uh, of all students before they entered site for symptoms. And this is one of those things that's changed, one of the many things. Uh, the CDC and the Department of Health say that that is no longer necessary. Parents and guardians or students themselves uh, should be doing their own screening for symptoms prior to arrival on site school grounds. So school staff are not going to be engaging in that this year. We are going to have a quarantine area on site for individuals displaying symptoms of COVID-19. And let's talk about some of our distancing here. Specifically in classrooms, we need to do our best to maintain at least a three foot distance in between students as much as reasonably possible. What that means is uh, the state has been very clear. We will not exclude a child from school because we can't meet the three foot distance. So if we have to be less than three feet uh, in classrooms to serve our children in schools, that is the number one priority. But we should be maximizing that distance as much as we possibly can. Uh, a couple other things here as we go through. Uh, school offices are open for business. Uh, adult volunteers, uh, at this time, we're not allowing adult volunteers on campus. Uh, that very well may change, and that is more specific uh, than state requirements at this time. Uh, so keep an eye on that and again we're going to continue communicating with our staff as much as we can. Let's talk about our masking. Universal masking is required for all school staff, all students, all visitors according to state guidelines and that's whether an individual is vaccinated or not while you're indoors. Okay so the short version here is if you're inside of a building and you're not working alone you need to have a mask on. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our masking requirements here. Again, universal masking is required for all staff, students, and visitors. That is anytime you're indoors. That's regardless of your vaccination status, you have to have a mask on. We'll talk about what kind of mask here in just a second. Uh, note that masks are not required outdoors unless specifically noted in this procedure. And the vast majority of the time an individual is outside, they're not going to be required to wear a mask at all. That's regardless of their vaccination status, that's regardless if they're a student or if they are staff members. Uh, universal masking is required on any district transportation. It doesn't matter if the windows are down, it doesn't matter if there's one or two persons on a bus, uh, you have to have a mask on. And again, universal, that terminology means it really doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not, you have to have a mask on. And again, keep in mind, these are state mandates. So we are obligated as a government entity to do these things. Other specific uh, activities that could have additional risk to them, like field trips or assemblies or activities or school-wide para meetings, 
These are going to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's going to be fine to do them, and other times it won't be fine to do them. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask your supervisor and they'll uh, direct you to the process to uh, do such things. And more information here on our neck bullet about our student activities and field trips. Those need to be submitted to my office and your supervisor is going to have information to do so if that applies to you. And just keep in mind, folks, here, I'm going to go through this really fast. You can read this in uh, greater detail on your own time. just want to pull out some of the highlights here. So we're going to talk some, of, some, some a little bit here about our high-risk activities. Um, physical education classes, any indoor PE class requires masking. And, of course, we know that because anything that happens indoors is going to require masking. But PE classes, even, uh, even a physical education class, if they're outdoors, masks are not required. Uh, and that is for both staff and students. Sporting events are a little unique here. If this is something that uh, is in your realm of expertise, I recommend you talk to our athletic director uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm gonna skip over some of this. You can read this on your own. Performing arts and singing, this does apply to quite a few folks here. So I'll just say, uh, more specific requirements here for, performer, for performing arts and singing. This includes singing or uh, doing speech and debate or theater performances. That includes singing in an elementary classroom. That is considered performing arts. One of the big changes here is that a medium risk mask is required, not only of all staff, but also of students who are engaging in that performing arts uh, performance indoors, whether that's practice or whatever that looks like. If they're inside, the students have to have a medium risk mask on. And uh, we'll get to this in just a bit, but I'll highlight it now. Uh, for masking, when we talk about our low, medium, and high risks masks, I want you to understand what that means. So a low risk mask is considered a cloth face covering. This is a bandana, it can be a handkerchief, it can be a gaiter, it can be a cloth mask. Uh, you clean these by just putting them in the normal laundry, they're multiple use, uh, and they are for low risk settings, which we've already talked about. That's we're not around kids, we're not around members of the public, and that would be an office setting where that's not open to the public essentially. Uh, for essentially all other settings, when our staff is working or could work with members of the public, or kids are on site that location in any capacity, all the staff members need to be wearing a medium risk mask. A, really, a medium risk mask is considered a surgical mask, a dust mask, or a KN95 mask. This is a higher uh, level of protection than a low risk mask. A medium risk mask also uh, would be considered to be a cloth face covering and a face shield, that would be another layer of protection that would qualify as a medium risk mask. So when I say specifically performing arts, that this is required of all staff and students, uh, the reason why this is unique here is because students, while they're on-site school property, as, at least as of right now, according to the, the requirements, they are required to wear a low risk face, facial club covering, a cloth mask. Staff, again, if you're working with kids or your offices are open to the public in any way, shape, or form, you are required to wear at least a medium risk mask. Okay, so here in performing arts, again, students have a greater level of protection. They need to be wearing a medium risk mask. That includes musicians, singers, and of course, singing in elementary, speech, debate, theater performances, and you can see that in our guidelines right here. Some other information here specifically for band, and we'll skip over that for now. Some information here on spectators, if that applies to you, you can read through that. Uh, we're gonna be modifying school drills this year, similarly to what we did last year, uh, to limit in-person interaction. It just doesn't seem like a great idea to me right now uh, to have, at some of our large sites, several thousand people coming together in close quarters to practice an evacuation. Uh, COVID is a real hazard that we are concerned about, so our drills are going to be modified to tabletop-based conversations. Uh, we still need to talk about other hazards, of course, uh, outside of COVID-19, and we need to make sure our kids know what those hazards are. So make sure that you are familiar with our hazards, and when you go through your, your formalized new hire training uh, with me, we'll talk about some of those emergency hazards 
and where you can find procedures for those. Some information here about hand washing and how we're uh, encouraging staff and students to do that throughout the day, and some information here about ventilation rates being uh, increased to the highest level wherever possible. Uh, let's specifically talk about our students and the requirements that are uh, in place for them. We've mentioned some of them, but we'll go over them again real briefly. Again, any student who's sick or has some of these other factors that we see here on the first bullet point, uh, they should not be coming on site. And they ought to be screening at home, uh, either by themselves if they're an adult or if uh, they have a guardian available, they need to self-screen prior, prior to arrival to school rounds. And we've already mentioned that each school building and site is gonna be developing a safety plan it's gonna include specific questions that you might have for how are we doing drop off or pickup? How are we doing lunch? What does passing and free times look like? That is gonna be specifically notated in your site specific incident action plan. I highly encourage you to reach out, talk to your supervisor about what that plan looks like. Facial coverings are required for students who are age two and older, and that is a cloth face covering. It's a low risk face covering. We have a link here because again, uh, these are defined by the Department of Health. Uh, face coverings and masks are not required outside for students or staff, so if we have kids going outside, they can take those masks off. And of course, if a child is drinking or eating, same thing with staff, they can take their face coverings off at that time. Uh, if you're a teacher, please note that uh, your kids need to be assigned a seat in your classroom this year, so we know where they're sitting and who is around them for close contact tracing. Uh, frequently touched objects. This is a big change from last year. Uh, the Department of Health and Labor and Industries have really pulled back on their cleaning requirements for surfaces. Um, this year, uh, cleaning with soap and water during the day is sufficient, and all of our frequently touched surfaces are cleaned and dis disinfected each night after students leave. And again, this is not just a Monroe School District decision. This is guidance that's coming from federal entities and our local Department of Health. Uh, and we align to those standards. That means water fountains, vending machines, other things are open for student use, and that's a big change. Last year, uh, we couldn't share a stapler in between students in the classroom. This year, we can, uh, and that is notated here in our protocols. Uh, we've already got some information here about displaying signs of illness or symptoms. Obviously, that's an isolation and a quarantine uh, case, and you can see uh, both here in our uh, our procedure and directly on the Department of Health uh, what some of the steps look like if you are interested in that. Uh, let's continue and talk about our staff controls here. It's important that you know that uh, regardless of where you work, your job site has a COVID-19 supervisor. This is a, an administrator or a manager whose specific role or at least one of their specific roles is to ensure that this COVID-19 safety plan and the site-specific COVID-19 safety plan are enforced and followed on your site. Uh, if you have any question about who that person is, contact your supervisor. It's probably them. Uh, if it's not them, they're going to know who it is for your site. They'll also be specifically notated on the top of your site-specific incident action plan. We've already talked about how staff have to be fully vaccinated by October 18th or have an exemption in place. And of course, we expect our teachers to comply with the law and regulations for safety uh, when they're on site. Uh, all right, let's talk uh, a little bit more about masks here. We've got uh, this tab that says, individuals who engage in high risk job tasks will don high risk level of PPE. We've talked about how we expect all staff uh, who are engaging or could engage with the public or any staff member who has the, uh, the interaction with students to any degree, they are at least a medium risk classification. Therefore, they have to wear at least a medium risk level of protection, which is a surgical mask, a KN95 mask, or perhaps a cloth mask and a face shield. There are some individuals who are going to be engaging in a high risk setting. Now keep in mind, uh, when your supervisor is determining an employee's risk level, they can take everything into account. That includes vaccination status. We know uh, that by October 18th, all employees for the Monroe School District are going to be fully vaccinated. And so an entity who was perhaps last year considered a high risk employee 
now that we know they're fully vaccinated, that's an additional level of protection, they may not be classified as a high-risk employee this year. Uh, case in point here, I want you to talk to your supervisor, make sure you know what your specific risk level is for your job. The vast majority of staff in the Monroe School District are still going to be a medium risk level. And again, that's regardless of if you're vaccinated or not, if you're working around students uh, or uh, your site is open to the public. And you can see we've got a chart here. This is current uh, as of today. Uh, however, keep in mind things change and we'll update you as soon as we, uh, we have updated information. We've got essentially two different categories here, outdoors and indoors, masking and social distancing requirements. And then we've got either your site is open to the public and students are there, or your site is closed to the public and you don't have any students there. And what I have in here is the masking and the social distancing requirements. And you can see that essentially if you're outdoors, any staff, students, no masks are required. We do need to be keeping six foot distance staff members as much as possible from other adults even if we're outside. So please make sure you keep doing that. Uh, and six foot distancing, uh, of course, even if kids are on site. Um, indoors, a little bit different here. Medium wrist mask is required. We've mentioned that a few times. We've mentioned three foot distance is required in the classroom between students as much as possible. Please note uh, that that distance, that three foot distance is specifically for kids in between kids. Adults should be keeping six foot distance, again, as much as we reasonably can. Um, so you don't need to be carrying around a couple of yardsticks with you to make sure that you're six feet away, uh, but you should be mindful that the more distance that you can have in between adults, the better off as far as our safety policy is concerned. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, I think we've talked about our masking requirements here. Uh, again, masks can be removed for eating and drinking activities. Uh, and this is per the governor's order uh, for uh, both outside, that's the Secretary of State's order, and uh, our vaccination requirements you're going to find in this order right here, which I've linked to so you can see that proclamation directly. We've talked about our disposable mask, our medium risk mask, uh, using uh, being required to be used at works by all persons who have student interaction or supervision, uh, which is fine. We've talked about hand washing. This applies to students and staff when they come to work. Uh, I should note uh, an alternative also is just fine here. So if students or staff uh, come to work or they're going over to lunch and we don't have time to have everybody wash their hands using a hand sanitizer that's at least 60% alcohol uh, is entirely acceptable. And as a district, we provide uh, that to all work locations. Let's let's talk about providing PPE real quickly since we're here. Uh, your employer is required to provide you, the employee, uh, what you need to do your job safely. So if you need a medium risk mask, as outlined in this policy, the employer is required to provide that to you. If you need a cloth face covering to do your job safely, your employer is required to provide that to you. If you need personal protective equipment, PPE, whether that's a mask, whether that's a hand sanitizer, you can look at your site-specific safety plan and there will be some contact information on there, specifically how to get more PPE. Uh, and I wanna make sure you know how to do that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, masks and cleanings and reuse uh, when we after we go through our COVID-19 safety plan here. So we'll get there. Uh, respiratory etiquette, covering coughs and sneezing with the arm or elbow, that is, something that we need to be doing. A uh, good new social norm here. And we've talked about uh, quarantining and isolation for individuals who appear sick or symptomatic in the workplace. Uh, last thing here on our, our safety plan is this increased risk categories and remote workers. Uh, if you think that you might be at an increased risk of contracting COVID-19, uh, whether that's because you have an existing respiratory condition or something else, uh, I want you to reach out to our human resources department uh, in case you might need an accommodation. So feel free to reach out to them uh, and they're going to take care of you. We've got a great team in our human resources department. Uh, in this additional resources section, I have linked a bunch of information uh, 
uh, for you that goes both to the Department of Health, which I've showed you how to get to already, and also some of the LNI requirements uh, where this uh, information that we're walking through here comes from. So uh, I encourage go through, look at some of these links, uh, get some good information about why this is here. And uh, yeah, from here, uh, you need to look at your site-specific safety plan and uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about our mask reuse function and then we'll wrap this up. So thanks for your time so far. Okay, so we've gone through our district 10,000 foot level COVID-19 safety, our student protection plan, uh, and hopefully, uh, if you have any questions about that, you know you can contact your supervisor. You can also reach out to me directly uh, and I can answer as many questions as you can possibly have. A uh, couple things here. We've mentioned a few times masking our low, medium, high risk levels. And I just want to share some information that uh, you are going to be required to know uh, on site about wearing our masks. Uh, and so let's just talk about these very briefly. What I'm holding right now is a KN95. This is a medium risk mask. And again, all staff. If you are in an office that's open to the public or you're interacting with students, you're gonna be required to don a medium risk mask at least at the start of your work shift. Um, we do have some entities in the Monroe School District who are going to be classified as a higher risk and they need to be wearing either an N95 respirator for their job, which requires fit testing, or if that hasn't happened yet, they can don a KN95 with a face shield and additional protection. So if you are a high risk employee, feel free, uh, reach out to your supervisor so that we can get that process started to make sure that you're wearing the right level of PPE. When you are identified as a high risk employee, you'll get some other information about how to reuse those N95 masks. For all these other medium risk masks, these are designed to be one time use only. Unlike our low risk masks, which you can throw in the wash, uh, our surgical masks, our KN95s, they are a one-time use, uh, so just keep that in mind. And again, uh, lots of PPE available on site for you. Uh, other job tasks, high-risk job tasks, may be required to don gloves or gowns for uh, their specific job task. And I wanna make sure everybody knows how to put gloves on, how to don their PPE appropriately, whether that's a medium or a low-risk mask or whether that's something else. So we're gonna take just a moment, we're gonna watch a training video from the Centers for Disease Control about how to don different levels of PPE. Please keep in mind while you're watching this video that you probably aren't going to need all of the PPE that you see the individuals putting on in this training. Uh, you're probably not going to need to put on a gown. You may not need to put on a full N95 respirator, but we do have some entities in the Monroe School District, our nurses, our custodians that could be cleaning up after a COVID-19 case that will uh, have to put this on. So you need to be trained on how to put on and how to take off, that's donning and doffing, uh, the PPE. So uh, let's go ahead and watch this video, keeping in mind that some of it will apply to you and some of it may not apply to you. Let's check it out. How to safely put on personal protective equipment, or more commonly called PPE. We will demonstrate one way to appropriately put on or don PPE. More than one donning method may be acceptable to your facility. It's important that you receive training, demonstrate competency, and practice your healthcare facility's donning procedure. First, identify and gather the proper PPE to don, including an appropriately fitted isolation gown, a NIOSH approved N95 filtering face piece respirator or higher level respiratory protection, or if a respirator is not available, a face mask, a face shield or goggles, and a pair of disposable patient examination gloves. Perform hand hygiene by using alcohol-based hand sanitizer or washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Put on the isolation gown. Tie all ties or snap all snaps. You may need assistance from another healthcare provider.
Put on the N95 respirator. When using a respirator with a nose piece, fit it to your nose using both hands. Do not bend or tent the respirator. Extend the respirator under your chin, protecting both your mouth and nose. Pull the top strap over your head, placing it on the crown. Then pull the bottom strap over your head, placing it at the base of your neck. Lastly, perform a user seal check. Do this by using your hands to cover the surface of the respirator and gently exhale, checking that the face piece bulges slightly. Then, while keeping your hands over the respirator, take in a quick, deep breath, checking that the face piece collapses slightly. If air escapes through the edges, readjust the fit of your respirator and perform another user seal check. Do this each time you put the respirator on. If a respirator is not available, put on a face mask. Extend the face mask under your chin, protecting both your mouth and nose. If the mask has loops, hook them around your ears. If it has ties, secure them at the base of your neck and crown of your head. Next, put on a face shield or goggles. Lastly, put on your gloves. Pull the gloves down so that they cover the wrist of the gown. You are now ready to enter the patient's room. Well, welcome back. Hopefully now you have all your questions answered about donning and uh, doffing your PPE. Again, if you have more questions, we do have experts on site. We've got our nursing staff uh, and David Peritor's team here at the district office. Feel free to reach out uh, to them with any additional questions that you may have. Uh, it's very important that we wear our PPE appropriately. We comply with the policies and procedures that we have in place for the Monroe School District. And so as we wrap up here, I just want to encourage you that this is a lot. This is a lot of new information for employees. I want you to be patient with each other. Give lots of grace to each other as you go through uh, this year, as you go through your job here, uh, and lead by example. Uh, this is a requirement for our, our job to wear the appropriate PPE protections that we have, uh, regardless of if we agree with them or not. Uh, so, uh, if you are aware of uh, violations of our health and safety protocols, uh, you do need to report that to our Human Resources Department for investigation and follow-up. So, if you have any additional questions from this training, uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to see me in person here uh, later on and we'll do uh, some new training with you. I'll be able to answer your questions. You can always reach out to our district team or Human Resources Department and we'll answer your questions as best as we can. Make sure you talk to your supervisor, get uh, without any doubt what your risk level is in the workplace, and make sure you check out your site-specific engine action plan. That's going to have some of that additional information. Thanks for joining me today.